Good evening, everyone. My name is Mimi Plochet, for those of you who don't know, and I am Artistic Director of the Chicago International Film Festival. For all of our members out there, I'm sure that you saw our announcement of the full festival lineup yesterday. We're so excited for this year's festival and for this opportunity to bring so many fantastic films from around the world to you, wherever you may be, whether it's in your living room or your bedroom or the most comfortable place to watch a film. Uh, I can't think of a better way to kick off this festival season um, than showing this film, Odalenki and the Cakes of Versailles, tonight. Thank you for joining us. It's my great pleasure to be in conversation with director Laura Gabbert. Um, so welcome, Laura. Mimi, thank you so much. It's really great to be here. Great. It's an honor. Before we get started, I also wanted to thank IFC for sharing this fascinating and I might say delectable film with us tonight. Mm -hmm. Um, I also want to point out that we have two amazing IFC films at this year's festival, including Farewell Amor and Undine by German director Christian Petzold. So, Laura, I'm really looking forward to talking you, to you about this film tonight. But just a quick reminder to our audience members to please send in your questions for Laura about the film and uh, we'll get to them. So Laura, one of the things that I really love about this film is not only that it's of course this like sumptuous visual feast, but it also has some unexpectedly high stakes at points. I want to get that into a, um, to that in a minute, but I think it's a nice prelude to that might be to ask you to talk about your background in making um, films about the art of food. So I know you both directed and produced the critically acclaimed documentary City of Gold about Pulitzer Prize winning food critic, Jonathan Gold. And you've also directed, is this, is this right? Several episodes of the Netflix series, Ugly Delicious. Yeah, one episode actually. But okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, so, so yeah, I would love to hear you talk about kind of your background and how you got into making films about the culinary arts. Sure, yeah, I'm happy to do that. Um, you know, it's, it's funny. I mean, it basically started with City of Gold and my interest in Jonathan Gold, the late food critic at the Los Angeles Times, um, Although I am a food person, I'm an adventurous eater and love to, you know, eat most everything. Um, my first sort of interest in him was really because I had moved to Los Angeles because I had to go to grad school and I didn't really want to live in Los Angeles. I thought I didn't like it before I even knew anything about it. <laughs> I had all those sort of preconceptions of Los Angeles that so many people do. And I discovered Jonathan Gold's writing and it completely changed my way of looking at the city. Um, so I sort of, my sort of point of access to making City of Gold was really more about how someone's writing about food can change your perception of a city and can actually get people to explore their city and get to know it in a different way. Um, and I, I think it's this combination of Jonathan's writing, but also that food can really be this sort of access point for kind of empathy and compassion as well as joy. And um, so I sort of approach everything I work on that's food related that way. It's something that we all relate to, we all do. People seem to love looking at it on the screen. <laughs> um, but it draws people in and then it gives you this opportunity to do these other things, explore culture and society and history and, you know, ethnicity and politics even. So um, so for this project, Yotam, I was already a fan of Yotam Odalenghi, had his cookbooks and read his Guardian column. And I just knew when I heard his name in, in sort of combination with the Metropolitan Museum of Art, yeah. I, I knew that there was probably a lot to really mine, you know, in that sort of collaboration. And that he, he was interested in those issues. He always has stories in his recipes. Yeah. And, and um, so for me, it was really just, it's like a great de departure point, you know, to sort of dive into things like history and culture. Yeah, I mean, I think that like thinking about City of Gold as kind of an entry point and how you, I think, so beautifully contextualize kind of food and the and the um, artists behind the work or the chef yeah in terms of some kind of cultural or historical context translates so beautifully to the um, Odalenghi and the Cakes of Versailles. Um, before we move on to the film I though I wanted to ask a little bit about like what are the challenges in photographing like not just food but like food in motion and the making yeah. of it. Yeah you know it's interesting we shot in, in a number of different ways on this film. I mean, for the first time I was actually able to use a steady cam 
which you know, usually in a documentary budget, you don't get to use such things. But um, for the event itself, we had a steady cam, steady cam, and you know, everything shot before that is much more in a traditional verite documentary style, where it's handheld. We weren't even really, we really didn't have time to even lock off shots. Mm -hmm. um, but we knew Judy Fu, the amazing cinematographer who shot the film, and I really knew we wanted the event to have this sort of emotion and movement to it and mm -hmm. have the more of a culmination. But it also had to kind of capture the story we're telling, which is the rise and fall of Versailles through pastry, right? So um, it just felt like that was the way to really capture it. Um, yeah, food is hard. Food is hard to photograph beautifully, but I also have this thing where I don't want it to be too beautiful. Like I, even though I think I admire chef's table, I knew I didn't want it to have that kind of, you know, pristine slow motion, you know, kind of glorification of it. I still wanted it to look real, like like it would to you if you were walking through the Petrie Gallery. Yeah, but I mean, I think you managed to make it feel just so dynamic as well. Um, and very, you know, organic in terms of the film. So I, I want to go back a little bit to talk about how you got involved in the project. You said already that you were a fan of Odo Langu. Yeah. And some of the things that I loved is being familiar with his cookbooks is that he's such a charismatic and open and thoughtful human, which I think really shines through in the film. And you maybe get a sense of that from, from reading his recipes, mm -hmm. but if you haven't seen him on screen before, I think, I mean, that really shines through in, in this um, film. So, you know, obviously he, I'm sure, was selected first by the Met to head up this project and Correct. you came to the project, so you didn't get to choose your own subject. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you came to the project and then what it was like to work with him in particular. Um, yeah, so the project, yeah, this is, it's different than my, most of my other films, I've come up with the idea and developed it and financed it and, and kind of produced it in that sense. This project was different. It was already basically in the works and I was hired as a director. Okay. Um, so the, a lot of the kind of groundwork had been done, but, um, you know, Yotam was just such a dream to work with. He's, um, what he what what you see on screen is really him, you know, and he brings this sort of curiosity and excitement about what he's learning. And I also loved that that he wasn't going to be an expert; like he was really learning about this for the first time. He didn't know that much about, you know, the French monarchy. He didn't know that much about the history of patisserie. He knew some because he had first studied as a pastry chef, but he had never been able to do that kind of deeper dive into it. So he was genuinely so excited and curious about this. Um, and it made my job really easy <laughs> because basically, you know, I could just kind of put him together with a pastry chef and have him ask all the questions. You know, he was he was really curious to get to know these people and how how they developed their craft and what they cared about. And then also more specifically what they were drawing on in terms of you know, these desserts reflecting Versailles, whether it was flavor or technology or context, or, you know, in the case of Sam Bampas, the Bampas and Par, it was almost more like conceptual mm -hmm. art in a sense. So, um, yeah, it, it's, you know, he's, he's a natural on camera and it was, um, it was delightful to work with him. Yeah, I was wondering about, it was so interesting to me that three of the five, um, pastry chefs really had some kind of, it seemed a personal connection with Versailles that yeah. to be revealed on camera. And I was wondering how much of that did you know in advance or did that really come out from those like, those that, interviews? Yeah, that was all just kind of luck and chance. I mean, I think we probably assumed that Dominique Ansel had because he had grown up in France, but um, no, the other folks, not so much. That really came out in just, you know, getting Yotam to interview them and just come, you know, converse with them. You know, I think for some of them, they have this idea of Versailles, but then they had to go back and really kind of research more about it because it's, you know, um, it's a complex history, right? And even in terms of the technology of patisserie at that time, there's a lot to dive into. Yeah, I mean, and I love the way that you reveal that through the conversation with Yotam and Deborah Crone, right? And yeah. Yeah, um, you know, because you feel that um, it's like two friends having a conversation, but obviously there's so much educating of like that history and that cultural context and 
kind of the technology of, of, yeah. of the cake making and the pastries at that time. And also like we're going back to the cultural context, like what does it mean to be seen? And, um, mm -hmm. and, so, um, and then I love the way that you overlaid, like we weren't on them the whole time with the camera, but overlaid the conversation and the audio with the both the art objects, images of the art objects, as well as kind of other, other scenes. So I was wondering if you could talk about kind of that, those sure. decisions about editing um, and um, those images along with that audio. Yeah, you know, it's, I'm, that's, it's, I really appreciate that question. No one has asked me that before. I think it's, um, I just remember when we were filming, because Deborah and Yotam had been kind of, as Yotam says in the film, she was my teacher. So she was really teaching him about the, the history of food at that time. But we didn't, we weren't able to shoot long enough to capture that, right? So we had to kind of put them in conversation to have them kind of revisit these conversations they had had over, over several months. Um, and I remember being in the room filming them and they were both so excited to talk about the subject matter. Like they were just nerding out together. <laughs> and I remember thinking, I think that's, I think this conversation can work as voiceover, you know, and I, I wasn't sure because oftentimes you don't, you don't cut that way. You don't cut from a scene then to a conversation, but once we had established them and that, and that sort of that conversation almost as like a master interview, it, it just kind of worked in the editing room to try it. Um, and so it's nice to hear Deborah Crone's voice come back in as that, as that teacher of, of Yotam, you know, as you're cutting to Janice, you know, working on her piece. Um, so that's one of those things that you sort of, I think, have an idea, maybe this will work in the editing room and then it's so, you know, gratifying when it does. There's luck involved, of course. <laughs> yeah, I think it works really beautifully. Um, so I wanted to come back to this question about the stakes of the film, right? So obviously, you know, this is an event and, you know, yeah. referred to as like performance art, mm -hmm. the, you know, especially the chefs that are coming from abroad that, you know, they're working in the kitchens at the Met, mm -hmm. a lot is unfamiliar and unknown to them. And so, you know, of course there's kind of this natural tension that just comes from them. They have to perform. Yeah. Um, in under those circumstances and there's this kind of pressure to get it right um but you know i think also as a filmmaker you also probably were experiencing the same thing because you sure. had a moment to to get to get it right and to get what you needed so um you know i guess i wanted you to talk about filming under those circumstances sure and kind of how your journey at that moment as an artist or that process was actually also being reflected in um, the process of the pastry chefs. Yeah, that, no, it's such a good question. Yeah, I mean, because usually, you know, documentary filmmakers, we take our time making our films <laughs> <laughs> and you kind of have the luxury of going back and getting things again or, you know, letting it kind of simmer slowly. And um, th there was none of that for this one. It was like we had those days to shoot and you can't do a do-over. So... Um, you know, our producers did an amazing job just making sure we had enough cameras and it was sort of scouted properly and logistically it made sense. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's, it's a very different process and it's, it's, uh, it's, it's definitely thinking on your feet more, you know, you don't have that luxury. Um, and, you know, a lot of it comes in the planning, but um, I think that we, we made sure that we had most of the sort of the sort of things that would connect all the dots happened in these interviews before the event happened. Mm -hmm. um, and we had a second unit um, shooting too, because I couldn't be everywhere at once. So I was mostly with Yotam and then the second unit would kind of float between the chefs. Um, and then my second unit director, who's also the producer, Steve Robayar, just, we, he and I just were in touch all the time, you know, sort of trying to figure out, okay, this is happening here. Can you get Yotam to do this, you know, um, but it, it was, it was, it was pressure filled. It was, um, but it was also really fun, you know, to be, part, cause I, you almost felt like you were part of, you know, the chef's sort of anticipation. And I felt so happy for them when they pulled it off. Um, yeah, I was wondering, cause I think that must be such a complex relationship because, you know, obviously there were these two moments that could have potentially been super high drama, right? Right, right. Um, both with Dinara and then also with Sam or yeah. his project. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I, 
I imagine that as a filmmaker, on one level, you're super happy that, you know, there's these moments of tension and conflict that are happening. For sure. <laughs> you want to make sure they succeed. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, I remember when, when Dinara left that night before the event and her moose still wasn't working, you know, I felt this combination of this is really great conflict for our film. And I really hope that she can pull this off. You know, it is, it is this, these competing feelings. So yeah, it's interesting. It came true. <laughs> yes, <laughs> exactly. Great. I guess one of the other questions I had was about, you know, working with the five different pastry chefs. And I mean, was there anyone in particular that kind of you felt inspired by in terms of their story or? Um... I mean, you know, gosh, I, I, they're all so different from one another. And, and Yotam gets so much credit for really figuring out how to find the right kind of dynamic and combination. Um, you know, I, I was kind of fascinated with Dinara Costco just because her her background is much more humble mm. and that she didn't have sort of a, a huge, she has sort of a social media career, but she didn't have a big restaurant behind her or, um, you know, investors or a, a famous sort of bakery behind her. She really, as Yotam says, is such a modern invention. Mm. You know, she brought her architectural background to the the craft of, of patisserie and then kind of reinvented it in many ways. So I I just thought, I think her story is pretty unique um, and it's like such a great contrast to the other people, but they're all, you know, they're all great. <laughs> yeah, and I'm curious, I mean, obviously I think it's too early, but this was shot, we were talking about before we came on two years ago, because yeah. the event was two years ago and it'll be interesting to see, I mean, obviously someone like, Dominique is so well established and right, some right. are in London are well established, but thinking about the impact that it may have on kind of somebody like Dinara's. Um, yeah, I know. It's exciting people. to think about that. Yeah, for sure. Great. I know we have some questions here, particularly about the cakes. So, <laughs> Oh gosh, I hope I can answer them. <laughs> well, the first, I'm going to ask this one first. Um, did the Silk Road to Xi'an have any influence on the food at Versailles? Did that ever come up in any of the discussions, and this is from Kathy, but that did come up in any of the discussions of... Can you just repeat the first part of that? I'm sorry, Mimi. Uh, yeah, did did the, the Silk Road... The Silk Road, yeah. Yeah, and, you know, kind of, I guess, the history and culture and technology that was traveling, and maybe this is specifically around refined sugar. Do you refined know, sugar. Do you know yeah. if it had any influence on the food at Versailles? You know, gosh, I wish Deborah Crone were here to answer that question. I I do remember we had a much longer section on kind of the history of sugar okay. for a while and like a longer cut of the film. And I and I believe that Deborah and and um, Yotam really discussed that. But I, you know, I probably can't answer that question specifically. This is always what happens when you make a documentary is that that you're not an expert at all. You've sort of dipped your toe in for a few months. <laughs> but but I do remember Deborah talking at length about that and what a critical sort of role that played. Yeah, and I guess another question is, do you know if the recipes will be made available? That would be an interesting companion piece to the film. You know, it's so interesting because I was in a Q and A earlier and someone asked that question and we haven't really thought about that, you know? I mean, it's, and I think some of them are probably fairly challenging to make, but, um, Let's ask IFC. Maybe we can make those available. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um, one question is, what was the language that Odolengi was speaking with the museum director when they were observing the Bampa set up the Whirlpool in the gallery? Hebrew. Yeah. 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 Great. Um, and then I know that I was wanting to ask kind of... Um, and this uh, came from the audience as well. Did any of the cakes taste good. And mine was more like, were you able to taste them? <laughs> <laughs> um, the taste, oh my, they tasted amazing. They were all great. I mean, it's funny. I am much more of a savory person than a sweet person. So um, it wasn't quite as hard. Like making City of Gold was much harder for me to see Jonathan always eating this amazing Thai food and this amazing Italian food, French food. But at the very end of the event, when we finished shooting, there were pastries, a few pastries left over. And so my crew and I were able to taste things and 
they were, they were, it was delicious. It was, yeah. yeah, they were, I mean, they looked beautiful, but they were also delicious. Yeah. So they weren't just like works of art. They weren't just like Versailles show pieces. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 I guess, you know, going back to talking about um, that refined sugar and, you know, you're saying there was a whole piece that was left on the proverbial, like cutting rack door. Were there other um, pieces that, you know, didn't make the yeah. final cut that, you know, when looking back, you think that they were. Yeah, I mean, there's always, there's one scene I have, I have, um, I think about sometimes because we, Yotam and I took a trip, took the train from Paris to Versailles to do, to shoot at Versailles. And I interviewed him on the train. Okay. And it was just one of those great interviews where we kind of covered the gamut and covered a lot about his sort of memories of food as a child and, and I remember he talked a lot about the difference between French and Italian cuisine. I, and there was like, I remember there were like being like three really amazing sort of pieces to that interview that just formally never worked in the film, you okay. know, because we kind of play with time and location a little bit in the film where we're kind of always cutting back from Versailles back to the Met. And it felt strange to see him on a train in the film, just formally, just, just you know, stylistically it did, but I was really sad to cut that. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, maybe you can make a, a film about uh, Yotam and uh, <laughs> a great subject. Okay. He's back in. Yeah. Um, so one um, question from the Sen family is, were there any intellectual property challenges associated with shooting the art at the Met? And I mean, I was also thinking like you had this beautiful space with like, of course, these beautiful pastries. Mm -hmm. I guess, you know, on the side of like, did you have to get specific permissions? Mm -hmm. um, what were those challenges? And also maybe what were the joys of putting the art at the moment? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. Um, yes, we there, all of that was worked out with the Met as well as Versailles before we shot. Okay. So we got clearance to shoot everything. There, there were things at the Met that were um, still on loan from families, like there was one piece, there was one sculpture in the Pichu Gallery, I can't remember which one, but it had been on loan for a hundred years, <laughs> but it didn't belong to the Met mm -hmm. still. So we had to avoid, there was one sculpture we had to avoid. So yeah, we were careful to clear all of that before we shot so that we knew we could do what we needed to do. And then at the Met, we always had a staff member or members with us wherever we filmed. So they could direct us if we couldn't shoot something. Okay. Um, and then they were also there to protect the art. So I basically always had someone standing behind me as did Judy, our, our DP. So if you backed up a little bit too close, I would feel a hand on my shoulder, okay. you know, kind of guiding me away from something. Um, and shooting them, I mean, shooting at both places was a thrill because mm -hmm. we had to spend time alone at Versailles for about three hours with no tourists. And then we got an entire morning at the Met um, very, very early before it opened just to film art. Um, and I have to say that was, those were two of my favorite days just to, just to, without the pressure, you know, <laughs> of the shoot to just really capture the art, right. you know, was really fun. Great. So back to the people, one of the questions from the audience is what are the challenges of capturing the essence of people during such high stress situations? I do think particularly with Dinara where there's moments where she's looking right into the camera and you kind of feel her frustration and her pain. Yeah. It's so interesting. I mean, what I find in making documentaries is that, is that, um, once you kind of, I mean, this is a little bit different because I didn't have a lot of time to get to know people, but mm -hmm people kind of forget about the camera pretty quickly. And I think that if you really make it clear that you're there as a uh, compassionate sort of observer, <laughs> you know, um, it, it becomes a relationship. It becomes a, there's even a collaboration that begins to, to form, you know, where, you know, someone might say to me, oh, do you want to get this? I'm about to do this. And then you go do it. So there, it's interesting. It's it's this kind of strange bonding experience, mm -hmm. um, and I don't think I felt at any point. And I think you just have to kind of trust your gut too. If something feels like too sensitive, you back off maybe a little bit. But also, these chefs were so in the moment and under so much pressure. I think they really just forgot about us. Like we were the least of their concerns. You know. Yeah. 
Great. Another um, question from the Sun family is, did Deborah Crone get the chance to attend the event? Yes, she was there. <laughs> yeah. And she, she's actually in the, um, so be, so the event starts with the, the people who come to the event walk through the exhibit. They walk through the entire exhibit. So they take in that. Then they're guided to the Petrie Gallery and they sit. And Deborah and Yotam gave a talk before it. Oh, I think um, we'll hear a little bit of that. A little bit of that. And then we use some of that as voiceover throughout when, when the guests are finally let into the main Petri Gallery where all the desserts are. We use a little bit of their voiceover there. Um, and some of it's sort of, you know, going back to themes we've already explored in the film. But um, yes, she was there. Yeah, it was great to have her there. Good. Um, from Emma Frey, we have the question is, Odo Lenghi's reflection on the Carpo statue at the end of the film feels crucial. At what point in filming did you learn the meaning behind the statue? Um, we learned it while we were in production and I'm trying to remember um, who told me about it. I believe it was Lamour who runs Live Arts. She was sort of saying how that gallery is just filled with death, death and destruction, basically. <laughs> Um, and she pointed out the Carpo statue um, and told me the story behind it. And and then for a while we were trying to get the the curator from um, the curator for sculpt painting and sculpture to come tell us the story to record that, and we couldn't get him. It was a different curator than the curator from the exhibit. Um, so finally, we just had Yotam tell that story. We just recorded it in voiceover after after the shoot. Um, but it just felt like kind of such a great way to transition mm -hmm. to then the fall of Versailles, which is where we where we kind of go in that sequence. Um, and if you really look at that sculpture, I mean, it's it's you know, it's excruciating. Mm -hmm. So yeah, thank you. I, I I thought that was like one of those things you stumble upon during production, and you think, oh, we have to we have to figure out how to work this into the film somehow. Right, and I think it does work in seamlessly because so much of it is kind of Yotam as he's learning. I think sharing that with the audience as well. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, can uh, Michaela? We touched on this a little bit, but Michaela wants to know if you could talk a little bit more about your editing process. Sure. Um, I will say this was a very, very challenging film to edit. I mean, it's always, documentaries are always hard to edit because you are, even though you think you have a structure and you have a story and a sequence, mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, it's just always hard. It's just a challenge to find a structure that works. Um, I think this was particularly hard because we have, we're explaining this collaboration. We also have Yotam who has this, you know, a lot of really interesting biographical information to bring to the fore and five chefs and then the exhibit, and then the Met, and then the history of patisserie and the history of Versailles. So um, it, it was a lot of trial and error. And, um, you know, it felt like um, we, we really wanted to weave in the history, but really wanted to bring people in and get them excited about Yotam and the pastry chefs first and foremost. Mm. But I feel like that's what you kind of get to do. Once you get people in, then you get to fold in some of that history and it just adds context. I mean, the other thing that was really fun to get to work with was um, just the art itself. And even the the exhibit, um, Visitors to Versailles, it was great to be able to shoot, shoot those works of art and then fold them into the storytelling. Yeah. So we did have a lot to draw from. That, that was great. And that there's a lot of visual information to help us piece it together. Right. Um, yeah, I just think it, you know, it's such a, I think one of the beautiful things about a film like this is, of course, like that e exhibition lives on in the film and also this particular interpretation of it through the eyes of the pastry chef. But also as a viewer, if you haven't been to the exhibition, there's a little bit of regret that you missed the opportunity. <laughs> yeah. Definitely. But so I have a question about Yotam. Like, when did he first see the film, and uh, were you able to watch it together, or what was his reaction to it? Unfortunately, we were not able to watch it together. You know, Yotam was a real collaborator in making this film, and so I showed him a fairly early cut, um, you know, a rough cut, basically, um, because I also need still needed to get things from him. We went back and did a lot of um, voiceover audio pickups. Um, and so it helped to have him really understand what we were missing still to go back and kind of 
patch things up a little bit and make it all work. Um, but I, you know, a, a lot of filmmakers, a lot of documentary filmmakers don't show their subjects anything until the film's done. And um, I, at least my experience has been that I, I really want my subjects to like the film. Mm -hmm. And I think if you're dealing, I mean, Yotam is a storyteller himself in many ways. So I think I, I knew he was sort of sophisticated in that way and could be objective about the story and himself and what he thought was missing. And um, so, yeah, he saw it early and gave us notes. And he also watched probably maybe two or three cuts after that. So it, there was a lot of conversation about it. Do you remember what his notes were? Or, you know, what, I guess, or anything that you um, felt he particularly brought to both kind of the, yeah. I guess the overall storytelling and the process of making it, but then coming back in at the editing process? Um, you know, I think there were times where he'd be like, oh, I remember when I was talking to Janice, like she said this one really interesting thing, would that work here? You know, he had a, he could recollect things pretty well. Um, he had, um, I'm trying to think, you know, there was one point where we were kind of at a, you hit these impasses when you're editing and we still felt like there was something, even though this seems strange, we had a hard time setting up what the event was because it's it's not super straightforward it's like a food a live food event that is in conjunction with an exhibit but yotam's coming in to select pastry chefs to tell this story and for some reason it like we would show people the beginning of the film and they kind of be like i don't understand what the event is you know and so at a certain point, I think we got notes from Yotam and other people that we probably needed to go back to the Met and do a pickup shoot, which we did. Okay. And we spent time with Lamore, who's the head of live arts, and she gave us an interview that we hadn't gotten when we were there originally. Um, you know, so things like that, but you feel like it's clear when you're shooting it, but then you get in the editing room and you're like, maybe it's not clear enough. <laughs> um, no, I mean, I think the interview with Lamora ends up setting it up beautifully. Yeah, so that was that was something that we shot afterwards and it was very helpful. And she's also just great, I think, you know, the voice of the Met through Lamora is great. Yeah. Um, so any more food films in the future? I, I've read that you're working on what seems to me as a very interesting project, but um, that's not food related, but. Well, well, no, I, well, I actually am working on something that's food related. I'm, um, since the beginning of the pandemic, I've been collaborating with Ruth Reichel, um, who was a New York Times restaurant critic and also the editor of Gourmet for, for a decade, um, on how COVID is impacting the food landscape in America. So early on, we started talking about it. She had been featured in City of Gold. And you know we, we all saw restaurants close down right away. We knew they were the first, some of the first casualties. Um, and what we did is Ruth just took to Zoom and started recording calls with chefs and restaurant owners, but also farmers and ranchers and fishermen and activists and people in the charity space um, and restaurant workers, um, just to sort of bear witness to it right. happening. And, and then as soon as we felt slightly more comfortable, we started heading out into the field and we, we've been doing some you know, safe shooting to sort of tell this story. Um, and it's been, it's been really interesting. It's been really interesting. And, and Ruth is in the film. She's sort of the fulcrum point of the film. So it's kind of through her point of view. Um, and it's, it's, it's been, a, there's been a steep learning curve because we're doing this in a very different way than I've ever made a film. But I was gonna say, can you talk a little bit about what kind of that experience of shooting under these current conditions and, you know. Yeah, it's, it's been, it's been, it's hard, <laughs> you know, it's, and it's, but it also, um, you know, the big, it's, it's, we've sort of slowly inched towards being a full crew and figuring out how to shoot safely. We're about to start traveling for the film. We were, we have not been traveling up till now. Um, and I have found people to film around the country and I just direct remotely or give them very specific shot list and interview questions. So it does inform the style of the film. Right. You know, and it's not as intimate, but the sort of really cool surprise is that there's something strangely cinematic about Zoom calls where, <laughs> where you're plopped down into a conversation between Ruth Reichel and it could be a rancher in Kansas or, you know, a 
Farmer in Georgia or Alice Waters in Berkeley, mm -hmm. and you're dropped into their conversation and there's an intimacy that you don't get if I were there, you know, doing a sit down interview and having it lit and, and all of that. And so there's a, there's a rawness to it and a um, immediacy that's been kind of fun to work with. Yeah. And I mean, there also must be kind of a sense of urgency that comes through. Um, yeah. yeah in For sure. There's a, there's a, there's emotion and there's anxiety and there's, you know, um, you know, people have really struggled. And then there's also been people who are just, we've also discovered so many people who are doing really, really interesting, inspiring things at this time. Or or farmers who have been, you know, I mean, the, the film basically is, you know, kind of about how the, the push towards cheap food and efficiency really ruined the, the, the food landscape in America, right? And but what we found in doing that is these people who've been doing it very differently right. well, and the sort of ripple effect of them doing it this way, more people are really turning to that at this moment. Um, so, I mean, it's very much a work in progress. Yeah. We'll see. Great. Well, we look forward to seeing it. Um, so I guess one more question about the Cakes of Versailles, because I want to come back to this, but yeah. you know, I love how you do the nod to the let them eat cake, but that doesn't become like a theme at all in the film. And I just would love to hear you talk about kind of how do you make that decision? Because, you know, that's of course the, you know, one thing that the one phrase or that everybody knows that, is, you know, where you're directly associating cakes yeah. with Versailles. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, there are even people who thought we should like give a title to film that, but um, <laughs> uh, um, I mean, it is one of those things. But it, but you know, it's like this. It is. Um, I mean, what I what I love about what Deborah Crone talks about in the film is how she kind of brings it back to, you know, Marie Antoinette and how you can kind of tell her story through what she ate. Her last meal was right. You know? And um, it's like, I, I love that story so much because it says so much about what food can tell us, right. you know, that it is this gateway, you know, <laughs> into like, that gives you so much detail, you know, about her arc, you know, as a historical figure. Um, so yeah, we, but we play with it a little bit in the film, of course. And then did you have one favorite cake? from the exhibition, from the event? Or I should say pastry, really. I, you know, I, I feel like I, I, I didn't. I, I will say that, that my crew and I were very happy to have the um, um, Sam Bompas's um, alcohol infused jellies because we had been working so, so, so hard. <laughs> It wasn't necessarily my favorite, but that was probably the crew's favorite. <laughs> the toast with the jellies. Yes, yes. Great. Well, thank you so much for sharing this film with us. And thank you, Mimi, for having me. In this conversation. And gosh, we look forward to seeing what's next. Thank you so much. And thank you, everybody, for joining us. I really appreciate that.